we're here to answer your game, gaming or game night questions. Tonight's question was picked by our awesome hotel guest level Patreon patrons and comes from one of those patrons, Andrew Dacey, who probably voted for his own question. <laughs> Andrew asks, how do you handle when you've got a disconnect between the types of games that you'd like to own and play with the types of games you can actually get to the table? What brought this on for me was the Voidfall Kickstarter. I was thinking it looked really cool and was really excited about sinking my teeth into a really meaty, heavy 4X space game. But then I realized that I would likely never be able to get this to the table with a group of people that would actually want to play such a heavy game. And that typically it's only the lighter games in our collection that get played at all. And I have a hefty shelf of shame of heavier games that never get played. But at the same time, I want to play heavier games like this. All right, before we continue, I'm going to point out to Sean that Pandora is right there. Oh, that's unfortunate. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to clear that up, and I don't know what else we can put up there. Maybe you can put a box or something to cover it or whatever. Hey, Todd, free advertising. Not <laughs> that you paid us for the other advertising. We're just going to leave it up in the corner every show. Yeah, see if you yeah, get some we, extra see sales. See if you can find the... the, uh, the yeah, uh, find the copy of Pandora in our next episode. <laughs> All right, getting back to the actual topic. <laughs> if you want to know about Pandora Total Destruction, tune in to episode 182 of the Tabletop Gaming Podcast, which should be just before this one on your podcatcher of choice or in your YouTube stream. There, now we've thrown it in. Now it fits. All right, back to the topic. So first off, thanks, patrons, for helping us choose a topic this week. And thanks, Andrew, for being one of those patrons, though I don't actually know if Andrew voted or not. And I got to say, this is a great question. So thank you for this question, Andrew. I like the, the detail he put into it. I like these longer questions where it kind of explains why they're asking the question. So I appreciate that. So I think this is a problem. Everyone listening, like, I, I don't think you have to be in the board game hobby or the RPG hobby, for that matter, for very long to find this gap, uh, the, the gap between the games we want and we're excited about and often spend our money on and the games that actually get played. To me, this is very common. And I don't think Andrew feels like the one man out. But if in case you do, this is not a you problem. This is, a, I, I guess, a hobby problem. This is a common occurrence in, in this particular hobby. And again, I, I, I feel as this, this applies to all tabletop. This isn't a specific board gaming topic, uh, although Voidfall was a board game a 4X board game, but I think this also applies to role-playing games. It does. I think luckily or not, you know, depending on how you're looking at it, luckily I think the, the, the problem is more expensive with board games. Uh, generally, you're going to be buying some books you don't want, but you're not going to be dropping $150 on that big 4X game right. that isn't going to get to the table. So, you know, maybe over time you can possibly add up higher on RPG just because you're doing a lot of smaller purchases. But uh, it definitely does happen to both of them. I think arguably my superhero collection probably started as that and just kind of shifted over to justifying it as a collection instead. And then uh, Sidelong Gantz to uh, Invisible Sun, I think it was called for Monty Cook Games, which I think was $600. Well, wow. <laughs> something like that. They're out there. Yeah, there, there, yeah, are there are expensive the Kickstarter black box RPGs. Sets and, yeah, the yeah, black yeah. boxes. I don't know. I I, 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 I don't think it's as, as exclusive to role board games as you might think, especially when you're talking about big over the top Kickstarters. Yeah, fair. And I got to say, like, some of this is just it, it's expected, honestly, because we've talked about this since getting some numbers. I don't even know how many years ago it was now. Uh, the number of games that are released every year, the, the number of games that are out there. Yeah, there are, are a ridiculous number. I, I think it was 4000 released a game at, at Gen Con like last weekend. It's it's ridiculous number of games. Yeah. And not every game is for everyone. And that's awesome. Like, no, it shouldn't be. Everyone has their own tastes, their own groups, their own things they're going to enjoy. So it's great that there's that amount of diversity. But it also means that not every game is going to be for everyone, including your small group of gamers you hang out with or perhaps your large group of gamers. Yeah, and I think this is one thing. Now, things have changed slightly over the pandemic because I think one of the major groups of people 
who were having this problem were solo gamers uh, or people yeah. with with no groups or small groups or or groups that didn't happen because we are getting more solo functions in games there is a lot more where even if you don't have the group you can do yourself that's true fortunately your giant 4x games are still going to be pretty limited there are not too many giant uh, of the of those big old twilight imperiums out there that have automata i wonder if the, there might be a, a solo I, I wonder if someone's done solo for ti i'd be really surprised if they haven't there's probably someone out there that's come up with something so I gotta say, some of us are lucky that, that that you have a game group that all either either are willing to play anything, which is amazing. If you can find that group, hold on to them, um, or you just like the same kind of games. Like if you're in an area with lots of gamers, you're probably going to gravitate and make friends with and end up hanging out with people like the same kind of games as you. But you got to be in a fairly large city with lots of gamers for that to even happen. It's great if it happens. Though I gotta say, even if you've got your group of 4X heavy GMT uh, the Hex Encounter 18XX gamers, there's probably at least one person in that group who every now and then wants to play a game of code names or, you know, would really like a Knight of Azul so their brain doesn't burn. I have a feeling that, like, even in a group where you think you all like the same kind of games, there's going to be people who prefer one type over another. Absolutely. And then sometimes it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, even in a bigger city, you aren't necessarily going to find those people or you mm -hmm. think you are, or maybe, <laughs> maybe you're happy playing things once in a while. Uh, I, someone who may or may not be in our chat room right now really <laughs> loves 18 XX games, yeah. but a lot of the times they're only going to be playing those at cons, which is great if you can go to cons all the time, but all right. of a sudden when uh, a pandemic comes out of the blue and you aren't going to cons <laughs> anymore, all of a sudden you've got some games that, aren't getting to the table anymore even though you yeah. love them uh but the opportunity for that has closed or your friends you know move away or whatever it might be yeah. um there are lots of, of of occasions that can cause this out of the blue it may not always it may not have been something that's been ongoing it may be a sudden change of uh yes. situation and because of that this is going to be more of a problem than others right having a game sit unplayed is bad i can't deny that it, it's i've got a pile of shame pile of shames i i refuse to call them shelf of opportunity once the game's been there say over three months it's not opportunity anymore it's shame like you bought this thing play the dang thing why did you buy it in the first place maybe that's because of people right that's kind of what we're talking about tonight there are other reasons but i will always call mine my pile of shame or shelf of shame I get it. If you want to be optimistic about those games, that's fair. That's fine. But I feel if you've got a game for a long enough time, you should feel some shame that you picked it up and didn't get it played. But looking past that, some people are going to be perfectly happy having a game that only gets played infrequently. Like Sean said, uh, Darkling Blight in the chat, who I'm not sure if they're here tonight, but one of our regular fans is a huge 18xx fan. They, well, I bet you he wishes he could play more often, <laughs> but is kind of perfectly fine going to special, you know, 18xx style events to getting to play those games. I know my own copy of Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition. That is there for an event. That is there so I can call up eight of my friends, plan ahead of time, order pizza at a certain time. Like, we, usually for that game, we've got to relearn how to play because it's been a year. We sit there and I, we get everything set up and everyone picks their factions and we get the board all set up and we reteach the rules. And then we order pizza and we all sit back and we can discuss the rules, right? Like any rules questions, do you get this? Do you understand how this works while we're snacking? And then we sit down and we get to it and we play. That happens when, when I was playing more regularly again before COVID was like once or twice a year. And I was cool with that. I was perfectly happy with my big copy with both expansions sitting there that I only got to play with every couple of years. And some people are going to be totally cool with that. Yeah, there's a lot of games out there that just aren't suitable for, for regular play. Um, you know, some people may have the space to to you know be playing Gloomhaven all the time, and mm -hmm. maybe even you know ideally leave they'd be able up. to leave it set up. Uh, but some people might not, and you may be at a point where oh, I can't take up the space and the time to play Gloomhaven, mm -hmm. so it's sitting on the shelf because you know it's going to take me an hour or two to get it all down and set up, and then we mm -hmm. got to go refresh the rules, and then we got to play for as many hours as we can, but we don't have that much time so let's play something else this week 
yeah. you know, everyone wants to play Gloomhaven, but you have to find the time and space to be able to commit to it as well. You know, there's there's just so many things that can sometimes get in the way of, of what we would love to be doing. Yes, not just necessarily the people, right? Like yeah. Andrew's example is his people with him want to play light games, right? And so he doesn't get to play these bigger games. I like to call them event games, right? If I have to call up a, a different group than my regular game group and schedule a special night to do it, to me, that's an event game. And event games definitely fall in this. But I'm happy to own some event games that I only use a couple times. And I get it that some people aren't. But so far, what we've talked about are big games. Some groups have the opposite problem. For example, my group. Deanna doesn't want to play light party games 90% of the time. Yet we game with people who love those. Yep. Tori is a huge fan of lighter games. And it's it's funny because we've slowly introduced him to more heavier games. And he's he's starting to actually really enjoy some heavier games. And like Kat, when she first started gaming with us, hated worker placement games. We've now taught her the error of her ways. Now, I don't mean to mean it that way. Well, but she they, also didn't understand, you know, she'd had some bad experiences. Yes. With certain <laughs> games. And and it takes time. And that's one of yeah. the things that I think can possibly help out our uh, our question asker here and other people is slow introductions. Mm -hmm. These people may not want to change and they may be unwilling to change and they may just want to stick with their small party games. That's fine. But they may also just not know what else is out there. They may not, yeah. you know, they if they think the difference is, you know, code names and Twilight Imperium. Mm. Well, no, they aren't going to want to play that big heavy game. Yeah. But if they suddenly, you know, learn about, you know, Catan or, you know, little or even easier than Catan, you know, the introduction games, uh, the hand holding games, the gatekeeping, the, the gate, not gatekeeping, but uh, gateway. <laughs> gateway games that slowly can introduce people into something a little different um, and maybe up that difficulty level. And mm. maybe they decide it's not for them. And that's great. But. Maybe they also decide that they are up for something a little tougher, a little meatier, and you introduce that into your uh, your group's play, and you get a little bit more of what you're aiming for while still right. keeping a happy gaming group. But what I did want to point out is it could go the opposite way. You could have the one gamer in your group that always wants to play something heavy, and maybe you start trying to get them to play a little medium heavy, and then maybe we get them down to medium, and you try to find some of those thinky filler engaging games to get them interested in. So uh, my point there is just that this is a problem for all types of game groups and all types of games. Like I, We tend to think of it as, I can't get people to play the heavy big games, but it's also... I never get my copy of Telestrations played. Man, I would love to play some apples to apples, you know, and I just never get a chance to. I think it goes both ways. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I think it's it's more a noticeable problem because we're, we as hobby gamers are used to struggling with family members, especially yes. who, you know, love their Monopoly and their silly little party games and, and haven't broken into the hobby games. And so that's something we experience a lot. But as soon as you move up from hobby gamer to, say, war gamer, uh, you're at a different level. And they're looking down at us hobby gamers going, oh, is that all you're willing to play? <laughs> or, yeah. you know, uh, or the or looking amongst themselves going, oh, this is this is all we're willing to play. I want to play something. You know, I want to play Race for the Galaxy and not 18xx. Right. So, there's yeah, there's there's a huge variety there. And it's the causes. Uh, I think we sort of touched on some of them. but. Yeah. You know, the, a lot, what people know is one of the big ones uh, yeah. as, as far as the group goes um, and whether or not your group is, is interested is a lot of it is what you know. But some of it may actually be on the person who's having the problem, who, who's having the disconnect. Yeah. So I was going to say, I don't know problems the right word, but yeah, the, the, the person, one, the, one of the questions the you should ask yourself, and this is kind of important, is why do you want this game? Especially if you know it's not going to get played, but we're, we're trying to skip that. Why why do you think you're going to enjoy this game more than what's already out there? And especially when looking at Kickstarters, you got to kind of step back and look at it from a third person. And like, are you being, I'm, I'm going to use a bad term here to some people, but are you being manipulated? Like, like is the marketing working? Is it fear of missing out? Is, is there something pressuring you to get this game that normally your group wouldn't enjoy, but you still feel the need for it? And I think taking that second, like, honestly, I think Kickstarters are kind of like um, when you go to adopt a pet, right? You go in and you're like, oh, I picked my cat. That cat's awesome. You're like, I want to take it home. You're like, nope, 
And you're like, what do you mean? Nope. I picked my cat. They're like, no, no, we want you to go home and sleep on it. If you still want the cat tomorrow, come back tomorrow. And I think more people should do that with Kickstarters. Like I realize you can cancel, but once you cancel, you start getting the, the, the sunk cost fallacy. You're like, well, I already backed it. I don't want to go cancel. That's a pain in the butt to cancel. And I think that's important. You don't want one of the ways to solve this problem is don't buy games. You won't play. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly a definite aspect of holding off. Uh, I think one of the examples that comes to mind for me personally is uh, back a couple of years, pre-pandemic, I guess, we were, you know, we were browsing Kickstarters and we came across this really cool looking Clash of the Titans sort Mm. of Greek mythology game. And we had gone through the Kickstarter and it looked like this meaty adventure game with a bunch of, you know, gods versus monsters and all this fantastic stuff. And it was a big miniature game and it, looked, it was like ridiculous miniatures that oh, like yeah. you could change and you <laughs> took parts off and but but it looked other like it was going to be as and... meaty enough game that you know deanna deanna would really like it and you would like it it was something that i thought we as a group would probably really be able to get into yeah. and then we we thankfully <laughs> thank god found an actual play of the game we went out and and just out hey that's no, we that we raided game. Or we rated, yeah, we rated, we rated an actual play of the game. And I had already put my money down on the Kickstarter. I was yeah. in. I thought this looked fantastic. And we rated a, we rated a, a stream that was an actual play of this game and watched them flipping through pages and referencing dozens of handouts and trying to analyze the rules. And by the time the stream was over, I was over at Kickstarter canceling my pledge as fast as I could because it just it, it, there was no way we were ever going to play this thing oh. because it would have needed to stay set up on a table for months at a time just for us to be yeah. able to understand what was going on uh it was a lifestyle lifestyle yeah, life, you know gods versus monsters game um which isn't us uh as as people who tried to follow our gloomhaven streams uh saw you know sometimes that it's just you know life interferes so, so I think lesson one, uh, tip number one is do your research and don't buy games you know won't get played. But that's only for saving money. That doesn't actually fix the disconnect <laughs> that you have in wanting the game. But I do say take a look at your want before you act on it. Like, like make sure that you really do want this. Uh, people doing marketing are amazing at getting you to to want things you may not necessarily. Well, no one needs them. They're hobby games. So I, I don't want to use the term need, but things you want really bad. Yeah. Um, are the exclusives actually worth it is, uh, you know what, I'm not going to get into why you should back a Kickstarter, or why you shouldn't or why you should wait, but just, just second guess yourself anytime doing that. Yeah. I, again, you know, it's you, you probably, I mean, you may really, really want to play that, that TI, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you may agree, you may think, uh, you may even come to the agreement after doing all your research that this, you know, 4X game is exactly what you're looking for. But if you can't think of anybody else off the top of your head who is going to play it with you, you need to take a step back. Yeah. You need to you need to check yourself. Um, and I mean, and maybe you have the money and you want to be a collector. That's that's a different that's thing. Totally Collecting different is a different thing. This yeah. is these are games that you want to get on the table. Yeah, the, the point of this is to disconnect from I want to play and I can't. And you so, need to make sure you know who your players are. Yes. So, yeah, that's that's going to be I'm leading into, okay, what can you do? I think we talked enough about why, why, and yes, it exists, and everyone suffers for it. What are some things you can do? And so so the first thing is don't buy games you won't play. That will save you money. But take, like Sean's first com- last comment there, like know your group. That's very important. One of the things, too, though, is get to know your group. Don't assume. Just because Joe shows up every week going, let's play – to think of a party gaming sagrada so it's kind of mid-level right let, let, let's get together and play sagrada and the next week they want to play splendor and then they want to play azul and they seem to be in this abstract strategy somewhat light but thinky game funk and you're like man i really wish we could sit down and play something heavier but joe always shows up with sagrada and azul in that well maybe if you ask joe he's like oh i brought this because it's kind of light party games and i thought we'd all like them what i'd love to do is sit down for a game of a squad leader and you're like, what? You're into advanced squad leader. Like, get to know your group. Have a conversation. This We say this way too often on this podcast, especially if RPGs are involved. 
talk to your group. Uh, th- this isn't like a put on the grown up pants. It's a pretty simple one. Like, hey, folk, do you want to try something a little heavier? Hey, I'm thinking of backing this Kickstarter. Are you at all interested in checking this out? What do you think about this? Hey, we've been playing a lot of this style of game. How about we try something a little different next week? Yeah, no, absolutely. There, it's there. There's just something to be said, especially with gaming groups. Like, if you were a gaming group that got together from your FLGS, for instance, yeah. um, you've probably connected over a certain genre or type of games, uh, and you may have just never had as much interaction as you think. Yes. Outside of that, um, whereas you know, if I, you know, I've grown up with Mo <laughs> over the last forty years, and I think we know each other pretty well. But that's the rarity. Most of the time, mm-hmm. you're going to have your board game friends. Um, yeah, but a- even if you did grow up together, there's a chance that this whole time, Sean's been actually really interested in finding that fantasy game that actually scratches his itch, that, that gives him the joy that a sci-fi game does. I'm making this up off the top of my head, <laughs> but just as something that kindly diverts from what I know of, Sean, maybe there's something like that. Like, to be honest, I didn't know he was that into superhero games. I know, I know back in the day he was part of a comic book club at the local library and like supers, but like we never played Marvel together. And that was one of my main systems. So who was I going to know that he's going <laughs> to end up collecting supers RPGs and running them online. To be fair, I prefer uh, original characters to, to canon characters. Which there, is part you of the there you DC go. There you go. DC and Marvel have never really, uh, you know, yeah. I, much yeah, both I, love, I love reading those. I love reading Marvel and ca- characters, but I don't want to play them. Yeah, there you go. But like I said, just just talk to your group. Like you never know what you can learn about other people by just asking people. I don't know what it is. What what in our you know lizard brain wiring makes us want to avoid those? It's not like it's conflict. You're just asking questions, getting to know each other. Um, maybe sit down and like do a quiz. Like, hey, everyone list a game they've always wanted to play. Right. And then go around the table. Hey, do it anonymously. If you think someone's I, I don't know why you would judge someone based <laughs> on the games. But like if that's your problem is you don't want to get your opinions out there. But like check your existing group. Make sure people don't want to play those games. And I got to say, if you're gaming with friends, most of your friends are probably going to be willing to give it a shot just because you're interested in it. And if that's not the case, maybe you need to do a, you know, quid pro quo like right. Hey, you know what? This week we're going to play this. This week we're going to play this. This week we're going to play this. And I got to say, doing that, like if you've got a group of five gamers that all like five different types of games and you still want to game together and you're willing to try more, maybe like you play what are pirate games because that's what this guy likes. And then you play RPGs and then you play a dungeon crawl and then you play heavy 4X and then you play party games the next week and you rotate it every time you get together. Yep. No, absolutely. There's definitely ways that you can work with your group to come to compromises. Yeah, and I got to say, especially with these meeting games, um, maybe just get agreed to play it once and now and then, right? At least get some use of it. Hey, I know you guys prefer these kind of games, but you know, if we get together once one, once a quarter, once a year to at least sit down and play something meaty, I realize that doesn't really work with like campaign games, but like big 4X games, it could. Yeah, and the other option is maybe there's a chance outside your group to get this yeah. game played. Yeah, that is definitely another thought is find other gamers who into that kind of game. And here's where there's lots of resources, right? Maybe you maybe you find a new group, maybe you find new friends, and maybe it's just like a bonus game night that you play a different type of game with those people. Uh, whether this is heavy games or light games, right? If you're constantly in a group that's playing mid-heavy Euros and you want to play party games, check Meetup. And, and games at like Tim Hortons and coffee shops, they tend to, any of those I've went out to expecting to bring hobby games, tend to be people playing stuff like um uh what's the word guess who is always really popular at those events and uno and stuff like that. so they're out there again both sides right uh, if you don't have the people in your group to game with maybe i'm not saying it's time for a new group no like, no this isn't this you is can not have more than the one rpg group. <laughs> yes you can have more than one game group this is a thing yeah. and the other thing is maybe some people in your group do like those games right if you're gaming with six different people Maybe two of those six are into the heavy games and they'll also play them with you, but three don't. Then maybe you, what you do is you set up a special event instead of like, say you get together every Monday. Well, once a month on Friday, just the four of you get together to play heavy games. Absolutely. And, you know, within your group party, without your, uh, you know, outside of your party, there's tons of ways. One of the greatest resources, and this goes for, for any size city, 
Uh, you know, it's, it's easier in a big city. You've got your FLGS. Sometimes they have bulletin boards. They have open gaming nights. Yeah. You can meet people. But in smaller cities, you can run into some trouble. But even if you're in a smaller city, Board Game Geek has regional mm -hmm. lists. Go into Board Game Geek, find your country, find your state, find your city if possible, or your county, or whatever. Yep. And there are probably local gamers that you have no idea exist yeah. right around you. And, you know, these people, you can, if they're on Board Game Geek, you can probably look at their geek lists or at their, you know, at their own list and go, oh, wow, this person's got, you know, every edition of TI. I can yep. play that. Or this person, you know, has got 15 different versions of Uno. That's awesome. Um, or concerning, I'm not sure. But one of the two. Yeah, it was because in general, <laughs> the thing with Board Game Geek is you're probably going to find the hobby gamers, right? If you're looking for heavy gamers, this, this is a place to look. If you're looking for a casual party game night, BGG may not be the best. That's why I'm saying Facebook, Meetup, local game stores, um, game cafes, right? Game cafes are, are popping up all over the place. I know a lot didn't make it through COVID, but hopefully some more will come back in. Go and look for who's playing what. Now, make sure you're in obtrusives about this, but if you see someone playing those heavier games, ask like, hey, do you, are you part of a game group? Do you meet regularly? Do you want to meet up here to play this next week? Um, you know, do you know anywhere where people gather to play this game? Um, again, you go to most of those places. I know we're, we're as hobby gamers, we're always like, oh, a board game cafe, it'll be awesome. And you go in and again, it's everyone's playing Jenga and apples to apples. And you're like, but there's good games on the shelf. But you're going to find a mix of people and it's a good place to kind of uh, and uh, hook up, I guess, with new gamers. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, and yeah, there's there's so many different ways. Uh, pick your social media. I mean, type in hashtag board games on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, you know, look in your region. Well, on hashtag Facebook. board games is going to give you a bit much. But uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, read your check your region on Facebook. Check your region on Board Game Geek. Check uh, Meetup. Check mm -hmm. oh, all, uh, you know, there's there's just Tons. Tons of stuff. Hit the light up your library. Wander around your yes. library. There, there could be uh, a lot of libraries will have, uh, you know, a posting board where you can put up maybe, you know, hey, looking for a group that wants to play, you know, Uno, you know, whatever. Um, Actually, a know. lot of libraries nowadays have board game collections. Yep. Not as much RPGs. You can usually get D&D books, but you could stock the library and look for people taking these out. But what I would do is just ask a librarian or a clerk, depending on who's working there saying, hey, like, do you have a regular meetup? Do people come out? Is there a way for people who are taking these games out to hook up with each other to play them? And if they don't have something, maybe they'll be like, hey, that's not a bad idea. We'll just, you know, throw a sign-up form here for people who want to get together and play games. Why bright to play Uno? Uh, uh, or whatever, right? It could yeah, be yeah. to play Uno. I, I think you'd probably be able to find people to play Uno pretty easily, but... Um, um there's other places too right like uh local legions there's yep. a, there there are more gaming communities out there than you would think i would have to say especially when you get into casual games well, that's fair um uh, and in our chat room brian brings up an interesting one where it's not necessarily games as much as trying to find people who want all those new expansions right sometimes you've got a game uh you know and i think like i'm gonna go back to race for the galaxy again you've got race for the galaxy and you love it and, and you're you're good at it and then someone else goes oh but i've got these 17 expansions mm -hmm. and you're like well no but i i like the game i don't really want to learn 17 new expansions uh, that's a lot of work and, and i i think the game is really really nicely balanced right like this so thanks but no thanks i'm just going to keep playing in my way or ascension or you know <laughs> you know all these all these various games where people want to jam you know jam well, all these expansions onto uh look at look at the one we're talking to about tonight side there's like five like significant content expansions for that mm -hmm. game and i gotta say ryan i feel your pain uh my biggest problem is it, again pre-covid now i do play with the same people all the time i played a lot in public spaces so i was always playing with new people and in general, expansions are complicated compared to base rules. And I spent way too many times playing games with just the base rules because someone was new at the table. And honestly, again, the only solution I ever found was make an event, right? Make the event game. Like, yeah, we're showing up to, to CG Realm this weekend to play this game, but we only want experienced players. Think of it like when you read a con book, right? And it tells you you need, whether you need to know the rules, show up with the character or not, that kind of thing, you kind of have to do. So that's a totally... Had the related but different 
question than what Andrew asks. Andrew's talking about his specific group, but that is another way to get games played is to schedule events publicly. So like go to your local game store, whatever, Tim Hortons, whatever it happens to be. So one, once you found those groups, those meetups, the Facebook group, the board game geek section, do some kind of sign up, find a public place to play, meet up and play your games. And really, like we've got previous episodes about founding a gaming club and running games in public and check all those out for the details of how to do that stuff, because that is a big step. That's a step above just finding new players. It's setting up a club. Look for an existing one is my general recommendation <laughs> before trying to make your own. But if there isn't one there, that is an option. Now, another option, and this is another one that we've got episodes on, is play online. There's a lot of places, and now you're not going to be able to find all the games you want online, but there's a lot of games out there that have huge online communities. Uh, and this doesn't have to be a BGA or a tabletop uh, simulator. It could just be a, you know, I set up my chessboard, you set up your chessboard, and we play over Zoom mm -hmm. or, you know, play by post. There's a lot of different options out there, depending on the kinds of games you're looking for uh, and locations where there are going to be already going to be other people looking yeah. to play those games oh i gotta say there's gonna be very few games that are popular enough you can find players for that you're not gonna find a way to play online may not be supported by the publisher or may uh tabletop simulator is a good example of being able to play almost anything that's out there in one way or another on that on that particular platform but yeah board game arena is a fantastic way as long as one person in your group has a subscription i can't say subscription a subscription you can invite anyone to play with a free account for now we'll see if asmodee ever changes that but so far that still stands and that is a great way to get these big games played now that does not assuage you of the guilt of having bought a big massive thing but at least you get to have the experience of playing the game Plus, there's digital versions of games. So again, we're reviewing Scythe later tonight. Well, there's a Steam version of Scythe. There's a Steam version of pretty much every day's a wonder game. Many Asmodee games, Direwolf Digital, all of their games you can play online. That is a way to at least get enjoyment from a game without, you know, getting your game to the table. Now, another option is maybe you're really wanting to play these kinds of games that you can't get to the table but they aren't right for you. And maybe you're getting, maybe, maybe you've, you, you know, you really want that super mini game from, from Kickstarter. And maybe you do get it. And maybe you even have the people to get it on the table, but you're not enjoying it. Or, you know, it's just, it's not, it, these games aren't hitting the, uh, the spot for you. Uh, one way to start helping with this disconnect could be clean up your collection. You know, maybe yeah. you've been trying and, and really, focusing in on a certain kind of game that just is turning out not to be right for you and your group, not just you. Uh, and so maybe do a cleanup, you know, settle into a smaller gaming collection of games that do get played uh, and, and having that smaller collection and, and not thinking, Oh, I can get another one of these uh, because you don't have any of them already, you know, it helps uh, help sort of fend off some of those urges and needs and, and cravings you're getting for games when you look around and you go oh look at all these games i've gotten i play them all all the time that's great if i get that is it gonna get played well we got rid of like seven of those so probably not <laughs> um and that may help you uh ease away from some of the the disconnect by un under helping understand yourself what you and your groups are going to be happy to play yeah, I know I know a couple friends that purge like that, that have like I only have X games in my collection. One is 14. They have 14 games in their collection. And that's it. That's all they will ever have at a time. And I guess say they feel pretty good. Like they don't have much guilt at all. And their big question is always, if I'm going to buy this, what am I going to get rid of? And many times that alone stops them from getting or even in here's the important part, wanting anything else. Because they sit there and go, well, here's the 14 games I'm enjoying. Yeah, that Kickstarter is cool, but is it better than any of those? And they're like, yeah, possibly not. Yeah, I mean, you have to think about what's actually getting played. Uh, you know, it's it's really easy to look at shelfies on the on the internet and go, oh, it would be so great to have the wall of games. But odds are good that most people who are taking these giant shelfies haven't played most of those games in a very long time. 
Yeah. Uh, a lot of them, they're they're either publishers and or they're they're designers. You know, they get they, every time they design a game, they get a copy of their game and it goes on the shelf. Or you know, and, and plus you know all their friends' games, or they work for a publisher and they get one of all the games, and or they're a reviewer and they get you know one of all the games to review. Um, don't uh, you know fear of missing out, especially on things like shelfies, can really uh, be an unhealthy driver. Yeah. Um, you know, you may want all these games, but again, why do you want these games? Do you want to play them, or do you just want to be able to be that cool guy who's got a thousand games? <laughs> uh so there's, there's yeah, how much something. is retail therapy as well well absolutely uh right that, but that goes back into we were talking about the fear market you know, the marketing exclusives and that why you buy them um i i think overall the big thing is for one ensure the people you're with don't want to play the games don't just assume that your gaming group is like no won't ever play that have the conversation, find out if people are interested in exploring new things, trying out new games, show them the Kickstarter, show, play the video, go, doesn't this look awesome? And if they're like, nah, then you're like, okay, maybe not, but maybe you get some buy-in. And again, if it's part of the group, maybe you set up a special game night or you just play it with them. I know there's this, like they call them the geek social fallacies, right? You've got your game group. It's the six of us. It's the six of us every week. And if you play on a different night without someone, they'll feel left out. Okay, that's the put on the big boy pants, grow up. Sorry, big boys, private, big person pants, grow up. And and like that silly thoughts, like it doesn't make sense. This is games. It's about having fun. If you are going to have more fun playing this game with those four people and these other games with these six, then you split into two groups. It's not a hard thing to do. Maybe not the easiest conversation, but it probably needs to happen if you're at that point. Yeah, definitely. Definitely think about the the fallacies that may be coming into play and the the group dynamics that may mm -hmm. be coming into play and, and, and just take a good long think about what is stopping you from playing and why yeah. it's stopping you from playing, um, because by wanting to buy those games may not be the problem. <laughs> right there's there's you know it's it's there could be very different uh, varying other problems that has nothing to do with the fact that you want the game and your group doesn't play them yeah. um you you could be looking at it wrong possible now if that doesn't work you, your group doesn't want to be into those games and i'm not saying you should question hanging out with them i have to assume that you also enjoy playing the games they like to play or you wouldn't be hanging out with them see comments a couple seconds ago if that's not the case um find people who do like the games like whether that's at a game store or it's online or it's you put a posting in the library we talked about lots of different ways to do it find a way to play the games um possibly like i said online um meeting people meetups all those different things try to find people who are into them um do not force your group here's something we probably should have mentioned earlier like we kind of talked about converting your group you don't you can be, I'm trying to think of the terminology. You can be an uh, a, a advocate for a game, but don't be an evangelist. Like, like yeah. you're not, you don't want to convert. Games. Right. Bring up suggestions, see if people are willing to try new things, but if they say, no, you have to accept that. No, you, you are not trying to convert people. And again, Sean was talking about war gamers looking down on board gamers. Don't do that. The, the games you play do not make you a better or worse person than anyone else. I know I think we've said that on the show, but I just want to imply, make sure that's out there again, that we weren't trying to to say that the people who like Meteor games are better than the people who like to play Uno. It's all games. It's all fun. That's the whole point of the entire thing. If a game is stressing you out, you probably should avoid that, right? Like if, if you get stressed out over this, you probably should take a look at it, right? Like why are you getting stressed out over this? It's supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a hobby. If you relieve that stress by finding people play with great, maybe you just stick to the light games. I don't know. That, that's going to be up to you to decide, not something we can tell you about. And neither of us are psychologists, lawyers, or doctors. <laughs> Absolutely. Again, it's it's all about having fun, right? Yeah. That's the whole reason this hobby exists, is to have fun playing games. Um, and while, yes, there are competitive aspects to it, um that's not what we're really here to and, and that's not what we're talking about if you want to enter tournaments you can absolutely find people who will play your games that's Heck, a whole... there's that too that's that's a <laughs> uh, whole thing we kind of didn't mention but if you're talking about the hobby side of things and not the competitive tournament side of things uh keep it fun keep it enjoyable yeah. that's, that's what we're here to do All right, so I think that's it for our discussion on the disconnect between games you want and games that will actually get played 
and how to resolve that problem if that is in fact a problem. <laughs> Remember, we're here to answer your gaming game night questions. So you got a question for us, head to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, fire off an email, questions at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. <laughs>